all, I would like to give a shout out to the mall folks. Hi, guys. Everybody at Fresh Start Mall, yes. I hope all of you in both campuses had a blessed holiday season. Now, at this time of year, we tend to reflect on events that happened in our lives last year. And then we tend to wonder what may be next in this year of 2016. Surely we will have challenges. We will have highs and lows. We will have some major decisions to make that will affect our lives in powerful ways. Will we make the right decision? Will we be faithful to God and our faith no matter the cost? Today we're going to look at a familiar story in the Bible that many of us learned of this event when we were kids. It's the story of three men, an evil king, a fiery furnace, and a powerful God. There is an outline in your program. If you would like to follow along, you would like to take notes. It's pretty simple this time. One thing I would like to tell you, our memory verse is actually Daniel 3, 28. It's not Daniel 11. My fault. I gave the wrong information to Lisa. So don't blame her. Blame me. But it's Daniel 3, 28. Okay? Now, the book of Daniel takes place in the Old Testament. It was written about 600 years before the birth of Christ. The king of Babylon had conquered Jerusalem and brought brought the Jews under his command. We start our story with Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Then King Nebuchadnezzar ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. They were be, to be trained for three years, and after that, they would enter into the king's service. Now we're going to go through this scripture a little bit at a time, and we're going to be looking at some stand-up principles, standing up for our faith. See, these young Jewish men, probably teenagers at the time, they were probably 14, 15, 16 years old, were taken away from their Jewish families, away from their parents, their friends, their Jewish faith, and culture. They're taken to Babylon to be indoctrinated into the pagan culture. All right, principle. Parents, if your teenage kids were to be taken away to a foreign culture, away from your influence, away from the church's influence, would their faith be strong enough to withstand indoctrination into a totally different culture? Hmm. Have you guys raised kids with an unswerving Christian faith? I'll let you parents sort that one out. Now we're going to look at Daniel chapter 3. Now Daniel does not appear in this chapter. He's not around. This is strictly about his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We begin the story in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he set up. So all these officials assembled for the dedication of that image 
that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Now, we don't know exactly what this statue looked like, but it had to be pretty grotesque. If you think about it, it's 90 feet high, or like 9 or 10 stories high, and only 9 feet wide. With the building methods at that time, how the heck did they get it up there? I'm not sure. Anyway, the king ordered it, and the statue was erected. It was there. Now, king Nebuchadnezzar then summoned leaders and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of this image he set up. After the dedication ceremony, a decree went out across the land. And this is verses 4 through 7. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, etc., all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Okay, now let's get this picture in our heads. This is a wide open plain with thousands of people, many of them the big shots of Babylon, all standing looking at this 90-foot tall statue. When the music sounded, everybody does a face plant. As far as your eye can see, all these people are laying on the ground worshiping this idol. All except three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Talk about sticking out like a sore thumb. Holy moly. Another principle. This kind of thing speaks to peer pressure, doesn't it? Everyone else is doing it. I guess it's okay. The media glamorizes it. The movies glorify it. Everyone at work is cheating on it. Politicians and lawmakers have legalized it. In our society, the Bible, God's Word, has become a quaint old history book that has little or no relevance to our modern me-first culture. Isn't that what society says? Are we willing to stand up, literally, for what we believe? This was going to cost Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego something. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. It's part of the Ten Commandments. And it says, You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. For these men, the cost of not obeying the decree was made very clear. If you do not obey, you will meet a very horrible death. You'll be thrown into a blazing furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were being called on to make a choice. Live and compromise their beliefs or die in the easy bake oven. Stand up principle. 
I don't know if we will ever be called upon to die in a fiery furnace for following Christ or to die a martyr's death. In today's world of gun violence, we hear stories of a gunman walking into a classroom and asking kids, do you believe in God? And if they say yes, he shoots them. It can happen. More often, we are called to live out our Christ, live out our lives as Christians in front of others. And our lives are called to demonstrate love, charity, forgiveness, kindness, selflessness. Are there pressures and situations that make living our lives for Christ difficult and sometimes costly? Oh, yeah. And those are the times that we are really identified as disciples of Jesus. All right. Young men had a choice to make. This is Daniel 3, verses 8 through 15. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. We're going to schmooze the king there. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Well, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, so scripture tells us that these young men had some enemies. The astrologers went to the king to tattle on these men. Now, we're not sure if they were angry with the Jews in general, if they were angry with Daniel, who had been in charge specifically of the astrologers, or if they resented that these Jews were bosses over Babylonians. Whatever the reason, Nebuchadnezzar was made aware of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's refusal to bow down, and scripture says he was furious with rage. Okay, verses 13 through 15. Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, harp, lyre, pipe, all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? See, Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man on earth in terms of earthly power. He had conquered nations. He had unquestioned authority over the lives of his people. And his boast was that he was greater than God. How little he knew about God's power. Daniel 3, 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. 
These men told the king that their God was bigger than him and his punishment. They were unwilling to compromise their beliefs in the face of death. Now notice something interesting. They said, the God we serve is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us from you. But even if he does not, even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship your image of gold. They expressed absolute confidence in God that he is able to deliver them. But if God chooses not to rescue them, they know God will still take care of them in death. And in essence, they told the king, bring it on. They're not boastful or cocky about it. They are respectful. But they leave absolutely no doubt in standing up for what they believe. And this blew Nebuchadnezzar away. All right, principle, how many times do we pray for God's power, for a healing, to work in a situation, to find us a job or a mate, to open a door that we really want to walk through? Sometimes God says yes, and it all works out. But sometimes God says no, and that person is not healed. The relationship doesn't happen. The opportunity falls through. And we find ourselves wondering, where is God in this? Do we have enough faith to say, even if it doesn't happen, I will still trust God and will not forsake him? It takes stand-up guts to do that. Okay, next piece of the scripture is Daniel 3, 19 through 25. These three men find a companion. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire burned the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Okay, this furnace was huge, obviously large enough to hold at least three men. It was heated seven times hotter than usual. The three men are bound hand and foot and thrown into the fire. Now the heat is so intense that the soldiers who threw them in there are annihilated immediately. It was certainly hot enough to kill all three of them instantly. But then we see the miracle. Verses 24 and 25 says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, well, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Whoa. It has been said that it is in the midst of the fire that the personal presence of our Lord is experienced in mighty and miraculous ways. Many commentators believe, as do I, that this fourth person in the fire 
was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Remember at Christmas time we talked about the incarnation. Incarnation is God becoming a human being, becoming flesh. That's the incarnation. So this is Jesus appearing 600 years before his human birth. But he was the presence, power, and protection of Almighty God. There's another detail. The three men were bound hand and foot and fell into that furnace. Now they're walking around in there. So the ropes had to have burned off. Okay? Daniel 3, 26 through 30. This is, concludes our story. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Boy, he's changing his tune, isn't he? <laughs> Come out here. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors all crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair singed on their head. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. This cracks me up. But then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. The next verse is our memory verse, Daniel 3, 28b. Would you read this with me, please? They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. And that is Daniel 3, 28. Continuing, therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. What Nebuchadnezzar saw was the power of God firsthand in the lives of these three men. He called them out of the fire, no doubt from a safe distance, and went to examine them. They were not even singed from the fire. Their clothes, hair, skin, everything was completely intact. The only thing that had burned off was the cords that had bound them. They didn't even smell like smoke. If you're anything like me, just grilling in the backyard or sitting around a campfire, what do you end up smelling like? <laughs> right? Not so with these guys. They were the same coming out as they were when they went in. And then Nebuchadnezzar began praising God. Now, he still thinks he's in control, because he issues another decree saying that anyone who said anything against their God would be cut into pieces and their houses destroyed. So he, he's still trying to run the show here, right? I'm not sure if the king had a salvation experience at this point based on other events in Daniel, probably not. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were protected and promoted, much like Daniel, their friend, had been. All right, stand up applications for us. The conclusion is that God was with these three men in the fire, fiery ordeal they went through. God was with them and he walked through it with them. The lesson is that through life's fiery ordeals, God will never leave us or forsake us. God not only knows about our suffering and trials, he walks through them with us. 
a lesson that we can apply to our lives is that we sometimes have to do things that the world would be angry over. A company may ask you to cook the books to cover up something illegal. You may be asked to lie to a customer to save face for that company. There's a chance you might be told to do something unethical. We might be cheated, we might be tempted to cheat on our taxes, cheat on our spouse. But the first and foremost obligation we have as Christians is to always obey God rather than men, even at the risk of injury to ourselves or the prospect of losing our jobs. We must never compromise. When we face the consequences, when we are cast into our fiery furnaces, even if we are bound, we have the assurance that God is with us before, during, and after. He will be faithful and present with us. At this new year, we often make resolutions. Lose weight, exercise more, spend time with family, whatever. The vast majority of them are broken pretty quickly. How about committing ourselves to stand up for what we believe? Stand up for the Bible, for God's word. Stand up in this nation, founded on the Bible by Christian men and women. In this generation, in this society, some may be mad at me for saying this, we have excluded prayer, even the mention of God in schools. Families are no longer defined as a married man and woman with their children. Violence is glorified in the media. Corruption in government and in commerce is the norm. Same-sex marriage is legal. And the me-first mentality is dominant. We as Christians can stand up for God's word and for his principles. Will you stand up with me and seek to live a life of integrity this year, following God's word. It's going to be a statement of commitment on the screen. This is a covenant that was written by our Methodist founder, John Wesley, back in the 1600s. It comes from his um, covenant service. If you are willing right now to stand up, if you are able, and commit yourself to live a life of integrity in the Bible this year, would you do so? If you do not wish to do that, that's fine. That's okay, that's your decision. If you will stand with me and with others, let's read this together. I give myself completely to you, God. Assign me to my place in your creation. Let me suffer for you. Give me the work you have me to do. Give me many tasks, or have me set aside while you call others. Put me forward, or humble me. Give me riches, or let me live in poverty. I freely give all that I am and all that I have to you. And now, holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. May this covenant on earth continue for all eternity. Amen and amen. Be seated, please.